Okay, so you had just mentioned that your mom taught you guys so many things and taught you about being humble and just this is what you have to do and this is this is what we're doing. Um, and I love that. And we all know um, who your mom was, uh, <clears throat> Dr. M Maddie Moss Clark. And so I just want to kind of stick with that just for a moment and just ask you two questions related to that. One, um, what is one of the most memorable takeaways that you learned from your mother? I think the most memorable one is that my mother was a really very kind, loving person. And uh, but because she was stern, people always thought she was mean, but she wasn't mean at all. She liked to have fun. Uh, you know, we would, we would be riding in the car sometime and if there was an accident, she mm -hmm. would, me and her, we would, let's go and see it. We'll get out the car and walk and go see if somebody got hurt. Not that we was happy about it, but we was trying to see what had happened. Mm -hmm. So those are, that's a good moment. And then another moment is just, she was just a very playful person. She liked to laugh and have fun with people. Um, and that, that probably, uh, that probably is the most memorable moments. And then maybe the moments when she was teaching us how to sing, um, mm -hmm. you know, her technique and how she really came up with, soprano alto tenor singing uh, independently, that probably is one of the most memorable because we didn't realize what she was doing when she did it. Mm, really? Okay. okay. Something that God gave her uh, during that time. So that would be, you know, one of the most memorable moments that I could um, think of was how she came about with doing um, parts coming in separately. Right, right. I think that's awesome and incredible that you even brought that up. Yeah. I know for a fact, like I taught my nieces how to harmonize listening to your music. Really? Yes, yes. And one of them brought it up this past weekend. And so just to bring that up is just like amazing and mm -hmm. definitely, definitely bringing you guys in. And I watched the movie and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. But I just learned even more about how she maneuvered and how she got you guys to sing the parts. We just all love it. So uh, with that said, how long in general have you guys been in the um, music industry, the gospel music industry? I I hate to say it, but it's a true 50 years. Okay. At least 50. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe a few more, but we won't say that. We just say 50. 50 is phenomenal. 50 is phenomenal. And so <laughs> with that, in your opinion then, in your thoughts, mm -hmm. what has changed about the industry? So much has changed. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the difference now is the roots of gospel music has changed through uh, media, through technology. Technology is really the kind of the root to how music has really changed will be the technology. Because back in the day, all we had was a regular piano and a, a regular organ. But now you have instruments that you can transpose and from one key to another where you know, it's really funny that I, I think about some musicians who um, can't play like basic um, church, you know, uh, testimony songs. They can't play. They can't find the key. So they got to have a transposer to transpose the key in order to get yeah. uh, to your key for your liking. So I think technology has been the biggest thing because uh, technology has changed the process of how we learn, where mm -hmm. it took us longer and we had to be more precise. Now you don't have to be precise. You can go flat and they can just take a key and turn you up, make you make you uh, uh, right on the note again. Or mm -hmm. you could be, you know, you could be sharp and they can just change it. So I think that I think the technology, I think multimedia has changed a lot and changed how people act and respond change how we um how we address issues and how we address the music industry um and i think that people um are more in tune to beats as opposed to words and mm -hmm. messages back in our day it was a message like i think about i think about um song stevie wonder did uh oh god i can't think of the name of it now but he wrote it he um uh, when he would write songs his songs always had a message. It was always a message in his song. Uh, um, when you think about even what, what we do, our songs, songs that we do, my mother wouldn't let Twinkie or any of us to get away with just writing something that 
did not have <laughs> scriptures in it. It had to have a scripture. So if you came to her and you said, oh, what you think about these words? And she looked at the words and she would say, ain't no scripture there. What scripture is that? Where's the message at? When you were in so she used to say, anybody can write a nursery rhyme, but you're unique when you can write a song based on the scripture and it has a message to it. So that was how we were taught to write. Right. I, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's super powerful because I I do feel like we must have a message in our music Absolutely. because we're putting things out for people. And if they're not able to grab on anything that even can convict them, give them joy, bring them peace and give them like some sound direction. Right. We could be we're at a loss. We're at Absolutely. a loss. And that's very true. And the thing of it is that when, when when young people today, they get caught up in the beats and move into the beats. But when you think about it with us, it was more ministry. It was more about ministry. It was not about performing. Because when we when we would go sing, my mother would make us, when we got ready to go sing someplace, and she, was, she would take us, we would pray before we went into the place where we were going to sing. And we weren't allowed to talk after that. We had to be quiet until we sang. Because she said, when the anointing is on you, God will change your program and change everything about you. So I think about the anointing. And when I think about the anointing, I think about how what a ghost is to a haunted house is the way the anointing is with us. When we sing and we are under the presence and the anointing and when we step into the face of God and he anoints us, that's when you see things change. You ain't had nothing to do with that. That was all God. Yeah, so you think about the anointing, just the word, the anointing, you know, when people are asked, I was doing an interview overseas a, a couple of months ago, and they were asking, well, what is the Holy Ghost and what is the anointing? Well, the anointing is like a ghost is to a haunted house. When you go into a haunted house, you run it because you're hearing things and not, don't know, don't know where they're coming from and you're scared. But with mm -hmm. God, when you, when you, when the presence of the Lord falls on you, Whatever it is that you thought you was going to do, you ain't doing it. So that's like, what? come on, Holy Ghost. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love it. So you just said some amazing things. You talked about the technology and how more things are now more about the beat. Yeah. And um, where with when you guys message. started out was the message with the beat, because we love, we love a good Clark sister track now. We love a good Clark sister track. And so with that said, what advice, because there's so many people now, young people that want to be um, artists, want to be, you know, singers, singing on social media and all of the different shows that they have out right now. From your vantage point, what advice would you give to them? To, in terms of what? Now say that again. Just being a new artist. New being artist. a new artist. Mm -hmm. Being a new artist. I think the most important thing I would say to a new artist is, humble yourself because when you humble god will exalt you but when you're haughty and you think that you got something because you got a one hit it can tear you up and that is the thing i think that mo and then they don't new artists need to make sure they have somebody who's over them they need to have a pastor they need to have a leader someone that they respect somebody who they hold in high authority that will speak to them and tell them when they're in an era that will speak to them and tell them what where they need to be and then some things that we step into we shouldn't and all money ain't good money you know and new artists need to understand that that is it's not necessarily a good just because i offer you some money i could be damn it there's some artists right now to call some names who have taken money to do a project and never got the project out. Mm, mm -hmm. And they made them pay for it and they still don't have the project out. So we have to learn how to be a savvy in business. If you don't know uh, how to, uh, you know, how to get involved in the music industry, you need to get somebody that, that can tell you the truth and be honest with you so that you know what you're getting into. Um, because now I, that the very person I'm talking about can, she can't even sing now. They didn't tie her up. She's she signed exclude. See, it's words. Yeah, yeah. No, you. It's about know. words, okay? When you use the word exclusive, she didn't know that exclusive meant meant that she couldn't do anything else with anybody else except with them for four years. So you know, you when you when we step into the arena of wanting to be in. See, this is why 
you know, especially in gospel music, we think our world is big, but our world is very, very small. Mm. When we talk about the gospel industry, we're not treated the same way R&B artists are. We don't even get the money that R&B artists are getting, um, which when you think about it, where did R&B get all of their stuff from? From the church, okay? So when you think about it in that sense, I think that most young artists today, um, my if I was going to say anything to them, it would be, you know, uh, humble yourself and get somebody to mentor you. Have a pastor. Make sure you're going to church. Make sure you're attending church, especially in the gospel industry, because everybody that says that gets up and sing, uh, Melissa, mm -hmm. when they get up and sing, it doesn't necessarily mean they're living the life that they sing about. Right. One of the things about us was my mother would tell us in a minute, if, you, if, if you're not going to live the life you're singing about, then stop singing. Mm. You know, you don't, you don't need to sing. And, and the thing that I, when we talk about ministry, you never want somebody to falter over your life over what they didn't see you do. There's so many young people who watch us. There's so many young people who, who think when they heard you bought the sunshine and uh, a higher, they, 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 don't, they don't realize that's not a new song. That song been out for years. Then the, the message to the song, higher, higher means life. So when, we, when, 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 when you think about the words to the song and the message of the song, then you, you can understand why we are where we are today. It's not about music. It's all about ministry. Mm -hmm. And that's what these artists need to understand today. Everything is about, about money and all money ain't good money. And sometimes we take money. Sometimes my mother used to tell us, we used to get mad at her. Yeah. And in the movie, you probably saw that. We would go someplace to sing and we think we're going to get paid. And the person would say, well, Dr. Clark, thank you so much for coming and thank you for bringing your girls. We so appreciate it. Walk away with it. And we get in the car. We ain't getting no money. We're not getting, we're not going to get no money, mom. Everything is not about money. Because mm -hmm. listen to this, some doors got open for you. Those doors may not necessarily be you from the place that you went to, but it may be from the person that's sitting in the audience that heard you sing and said, oh, I want to get them. Oh, I want them to go. And that's how, how things was with us. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how we became famous. Frankie Crocker out of New York was a, a DJ who, um, Came in late for work one day, didn't know he was trying to rush to set up his records as he was doing that. He looked at the he looked at our album cover and said, Well, you bought the sunshine, must be the hit. Let me play that. And, it, and the church people had the gospel artists, gospel DJs never ever played it for two years. So, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's just where your head is and how how bad do you want to do this? Yeah. But my thing is if you want to do it for God. He can do things in your life and in your ministry that nobody else can do. Absolutely. Yeah. You have just shared so much wisdom. I want to put it in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so much wisdom. I just, so much wisdom. Thank and you, you brought up um, about the movie. So um, that was amazing. It was incredible. We all sat around my nieces and everybody. It was a thing. It was a thing. Um, so Tell me, um, were you pleased with the outcome of the movie? How did you feel about the movie? I absolutely love the movie. I think uh, Ajinu, who played my mother, <clears throat> and, and all of the ladies in the movie, they were excellent. Every last one of them did a superb job, including my niece. I was very proud of her as well. I think that the movie just gave you really the icing of our life journey. Uh, but what's, what was most uh, what we're most grateful for is the fact that somebody would look at our lives and say, "I want to write a movie about them." Mm. If somebody called you on the phone today, Melissa, and said, "I want to write a movie about your life," you know, what would you say? What would you think? And so really? we sat down with the people, and we gave our story. So what they did was. They really wanted to make it, it really should have been a short series. It really should have been because there's so many things that were cut out that were great things that could not be put into the movie. And so uh, because it was making it too long. And so um, I think the most important thing about the movie to me was I felt like when I was looking at, uh, um, what's her name? 
when I was looking at uh, Angie Pitt playing my part, when I saw her, I unbelieve. I said, that's me. I mean, I really felt like it wasn't her on the screen. It was actually me. Right. She right. studied me. She came and sat with me for a few days and all day long. She followed me, watched me, everything that I did and um, just became me overnight as all the other girls did. I think uh, um, the girl that played Dorinda, she was superb as well. She she really got Dorinda's part and she did an excellent job. So I think that the movie, the most thing that I think I'm proud of would be the fact that how God allowed it to come out. Mm. At the beginning of a pandemic when everybody had to be home and it was the biggest, it, it, to this day, it's still the biggest lifetime movie ever. So, and we some little old, little old black girls from Detroit, Michigan, who ain't, don't claim nothing but Jesus, okay? Yeah. Uh, and they wrote, they wrote the story about us and the rest is history at this point. It was incredible. I know so many people, including myself, would love a part two. <laughs> Girl, bye. We ain't doing that. I know. 